Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I would like to start my presentation by thanking Cap McWhorter for the, all the wonderful things he said about me. I was lucky enough to have him as a teacher my junior year of high school at Atascacita. I took his social action class where we were encouraged to uh, take action in the community and change the world. He gave us a whole semester to design our own project and just see how much we could do for other people. I took that and, as he said, uh, sent a water purification system to Haiti. And from that, I was invited to go to Africa. And I spent a month of July 2010 in Malawi and Mozambique repairing water wells and installing another water purification system. And that's, this is where I learned about the concept of Madzi Roulette. And what, that, what Madzi means is it's water in Chichewa, which is the native language of Malawi. And so I would like to begin by asking you all to remember your childhood and remember the, your fondest memories from when you were little. One thing that I loved is my family would always go to the beach every year. We'd always rent a beach house and stay down on Galveston. I, uh, I remember we'd just run around in the sand and we'd play all day and get covered in the, that gritty sand. And every time we'd come in, my mom would make us wash off with a hose and wash everything off. And by the time the week was over, everything we brought was covered in sand and dirt. We'd have to put it all in the washing machine and hose it off in the backyard, clean everything. We used so much water just to clean stuff to bring it back to our already clean house and everything. We didn't realize that, I didn't realize at the time that uh, not everyone had this. This little girl's name is Morag. She uh, is a year and a half old and lives in the village of Chibuli. She permanently lives with that gritty, dirty sand. Everything they have there is either grass or the grass has died and it's just dirt. She gets a bath about once a week from a little cup that, where they pour water out of a jerry can like this one that they got from the well. She doesn't get to put her clothes in the washing machine. She doesn't wash her toys off before she brings them inside. That's all she does. She is taking a nap here, and the little rattle next to her is the only toy that she has. Everything else she shares with all the other village children. And uh, this picture of little baby sleeping isn't quite what we're used to here. When I was a baby, I know, this was much more common. Having the stuffed animals, the clean PJs, and uh, sleeping on the floor here, not because I had to. I had a bed in the other room just... That's where I lay down and fell asleep. But more I didn't have that. She's using her dad's jacket as a pillow and laying on a bamboo mat, which they were lucky enough to have. The jacket was dirty and sweaty because they don't have a washing machine. They didn't have a way to clean it. So, but it was the softest thing they had, so that's what they put under her head for her to sleep. As I got older, I started having more fun and getting to branch out, going to amusement parks and water parks and having, getting to just enjoy childhood here in America. And now, a place like this would baffle any African because they don't see why we would, you know, squirt water down a slide and spray it out of octopus legs just for fun. It, it wouldn't make any sense. But that's what we did. This little boy, Luca, is five years old, and he doesn't have all that stuff to do for fun. He doesn't have all the toys and games and places to go. While we were there, he and all the other village children came out and watched us. We were as good as the circus to them. <laughs> we, we had, all we needed was a tent and a ringmaster, and we would have had the whole show going. But they came out and watched us the whole time we were working, from sun up to sundown. When we were at our tents, they would crowd around us just like this and watch every single, every single move we made because we were the most interesting thing that happened in that village the whole year. And that was what he did for fun. Unfortunately. It's not all fun and games. When I was six, I broke my finger in a door at school, and uh, this was taken a few hours after I got home from the hospital. I was taken to the minor emergency room and x-rayed, bandaged, had everything cleaned and washed. Everything was very sterile and uh, very sanitary, as you would expect with any healthcare here. But it's not quite the same in other places. They don't have the resources to you know, throw away rubber gloves every time they touch a wound, they can't wash off every injury that happens, they can't clean the tools, they can't clean the uh, wraps and the bandages and the splints. So 
when Luca got hurt, he was watching us one day and uh, got in the way of a bicyclist. The bicyclist ran into him and Luca started, his head started bleeding. And it was, it was a bit scary to see, you know, this little five-year-old boy with just bright red blood. I remember just how much it stood out from his hair and his skin. Just running up to his dad, just crying, and he had no idea what to do. And even when his dad got and took care of him, he couldn't do anything. They didn't have bandages. They didn't even have Band-Aids or anything to clean it with. He splashed a little bit of water on it, but the water was dusty and dirty, and just like everything else. And I uh, ended up loaning him a couple little Band-Aids. I don't know if you can see him down in this little corner over here, but he has an, two Band-Aids and just an X on his forehead. It didn't even cover the wound because they didn't know how to really apply the bandages. They weren't even used to it. So I gave him those two, and his dad put it on as best as he thought he could. And Luca came out the next night and was playing with all the other kids. He couldn't stay inside. There was nothing to do. So he came out with everybody else and just kept on going. As we get older here, I got into sports and played everything from football, soccer, basketball, even did a little bit of baseball. But we have a very different conception of sports here. I had the uniforms and the, uh, we had our practices, our teams, leagues, and schedules. It, all just for you know soccer, a game that you can go out and play in the backyard. And for in Malawi, that's exactly what they did. We showed up with a soccer ball, and it was the first uh, actual soccer ball they had had in a year at least since the last Americans and Westerners came into their village. And they went nuts. You know, I say it's the last soccer ball. It wasn't the last time they played soccer. They ran around kicking plastic bags tied up in string because that was the best thing they had. They would use anything as a soccer ball if they could. They would have kicked rocks if they had rolled a little bit better. These kids, as soon as we gave them the ball, they all sprinted off to the field and uh, went crazy. They didn't break down into teams or make up any sort of schedule or tournament or anything. They just put the ball down and they ran with it. And they ran on rocks and dirt and some of the crappiest land that you could ever find. And they did it all barefoot. When I got there, I saw them all doing this, and I woke up one morning and was like, you know, I'm tough. I've been out playing and barefoot and everything before. I, I can do this, right? And there, there's no way. I made it like five steps out of the tent, and it was just horrible. There were, there were thorns you couldn't even see in the dirt. There were rocks in everything. It was awful. And, but these kids, they don't even have shoes. All they do is run around and play soccer all day. And with, unfortunately for them, within a week or two of getting this brand new soccer ball, it was destroyed and ruined just like everything else. Because there are so many rocks, it just tears the lining off of it, and then the ball pops and it's worthless. But they keep playing, they find whatever they can, tie it up in a little ball and chase after it. That's all they do 24-7 pretty much. Now this little guy's name is Jim. This is where the story gets a little bit sadder. Jim is 10 years old and uh, he's an orphan. His parents died a few years ago from cholera. He is left completely on his own. He doesn't have aunts, uncles, grandmother, any family network to take care of him. Jim lives on his own pretty much. And that, that's a concept that doesn't quite make sense here. We have you know orphanages and different institutions to take care of children, but Jim had none of that to benefit him. He was lucky enough that uh, Ernest ran a child center out of his house, and so Jim what became what uh, was essentially a, another child for Ernest and his family. He never got to go in the house or sleep inside with them, though, because he wasn't a mem true member of their family. He was always outside playing with the other boys and all night. One time I even went to the bathroom and Jim stopped me on my, my way back, shook my hand and said, hi, my name is Jim, even though I'd already met him before. And uh, I said, hi, I'm Matthew. And then I was like, how are you doing? He said, hi, I'm Jim. That was the only English he had managed to learn from the other kids because he didn't get to go to school. He didn't have anyone to buy his uniform or pay his tuition. But he had convinced the other kids to teach him that much just so he could say hello. Really, he just wanted his picture taken because they, he loved that. That's why he had his nice little solo shot earlier, and he's in just about every shot of the children I have because that was his favorite thing. He couldn't get anything better than that. 
This was the closest thing Jim had to a home. It was a small shack outside of Ernest's uh, slightly larger shack. And it was used to cook the food for uh, some of the village children whose parents couldn't provide it. Ernest had made connections with Scottish missionaries who sent him money every month or so to buy porridge, which was essentially cornmeal with a little bit of sugar in it. He would buy, and the women would cook it up and serve it to the children, one meal a day. That's all they would get. And then at night, Jim would be able to go in here with a few of the other orphans and have a roof over his head. But he, even this yellow jerry can out front, which was used for the water, that wasn't even his. He didn't get to go use that water and drink from it because that was what the women had put there to cook and clean dishes. He had to completely fend for himself for everything except that one meal a day because his parents had been taken by these waterborne illnesses. But you'd never notice if you just met him. Jim was one of the nicest, happiest kids in the whole village. He was always out having fun with everybody. And he was always smiling, laughing, and trying to get involved as possible. This man in the camo's name is Kunse. He was 17 years old. He had been orphaned at the age of 12, quite like Jim. And he had, was forced to drop out of school and quit his education, even though he was on track to go to university. He had the grades, and if he had been able to graduate from secondary school, he would have been able to go and keep learning. But when his parents died, he had to drop out and go right back to farming just to take care of his siblings and to feed himself. He was the only economic sus sustenance his family had once his parents passed. And at age 17, he had managed to become slightly accepted into the elders of the community, but he wasn't quite there yet. He was still in that kind of in-between young adulthood where they didn't take him seriously, but he was exercised from the children and the other families because he was an orphan. And he just tried to make the best of it. This day, we put him in the water committee for the village of Nyachakaza when we installed the water purification system. And so that gave him a uh, leg up in the social standings. He was able to take part in the clean water source for the village. We made him a part of it because we wanted somebody young to be able to carry it on, not just have the old men you know, control everything as they always had. We needed somebody who was more willing to learn the new technology and take it on, even though it wasn't much technology. He put in a little salt and ran it off a car battery. But he was crucial to us installing this because he, he picked it up the fastest. Even though he hadn't gone through school, he hadn't finished you know, anything past like the sixth grade, he was one of the brightest ones in the whole village. Now, I'm lucky enough to go to the University of Texas, and I'm a freshman there. But, and I'm, I'm so lucky, even though not everyone here is able to go to university, I have my parents who are able to help me out financially, and I get to spend all my time here. It seems like the most beautiful place, but it has some downsides that people in America don't quite realize how much excess we have. Of any place I've ever been in the whole US, the University of Texas has more excess of everything than any other place. They have their own television network, they have their own water bottle company, they have their own electric company. They make and sell everything just with their own brand. The point where it gets bad is they don't always take care of their resources. Things like this fountain right here constantly spews water and it looks very beautiful, but it wastes so much clean water that even now when we're in this drought, people could be using and drinking, but instead they just shoot it off into the air and it evaporates and goes and rains in other places. We don't get much rain here. This man is Harry, and unlike me, he was not able to go to university. When uh, he graduated from secondary school, which he did manage to do, he had to immediately come right back home and begin farming. He had the grades and he had a full scholarship to continue his education, but the scholarship didn't feed his family. It didn't help out his parents, it didn't help out his siblings, and it didn't put food on the table. So even though he's now an accomplished electrician, self-taught, he was not able to continue his education. He was, he was always so proud, though. He carried around a small book of schematics that were just filled with uh, diagrams and circuit boards and everything he could possibly think of. He would take apart radios and flashlights and any small piece of wiring he could get his hands on 
He loved it. That was what he lived for. He once bragged to me that he could build an amplifier so loud it could be heard in all the villages miles around. All he needed was a few bits of wiring, a car battery, and a speaker. But, of course, he really didn't have any of that. Harry took his electrician skills to complete maps in the village of Shkuli. He actually wired Harry's house with a little light. Now, this is a village where there are no power lines, there is no electricity, there are no utilities, they are hundreds of miles from anywhere that has any of that. But Harry and Ernest mined their resources from missionaries and uh, other, other income that they had. And Harry took a strand of Christmas tree light, ran it around the inside of one room of Ernest's house, and was able to run it off the car battery. So at night, Ernest was able to charge his laptop, which the missionaries had given him, so he could contact them. Had lights inside his hut so you could see what you were doing, and basically just didn't have to go to sleep right when the sun went down. Which was great for all the children and other people in the village. They were able to go and they would watch videos on his laptop. He would get whatever like, music video or These are the uh, true breakdown of the water use between the two places. Here we use 575 liters of water a day per person. Now in areas like the woodlands, that gets even higher. Here it gets up to, you know, in the eight or nine hundreds of liters a day thanks to the swimming pools and all the fountains and everything. Now what this number really means is it's about 150 to 160 gallons of water per day, which everybody knows what the little gallon is, you know, from the milk jugs. In Mozambique, they use four liters. That's just one gallon of water. Would you imagine doing everything you do with water? Washing your clothes, washing your hands, washing your dishes, let alone drinking and going to the bathroom off with just one gallon of water. That, that's all they have. It's so small that toilets use 1.6 gallons of water every time you flush it. Every time you flush the toilet, you're using you know, uh, three and a half times the amount of water that they use every single day for everything they do. What's worse than ju them just having one gallon of water a day is none of it's even clean. They pump waters out of wells if they're lucky enough to have it, or they just collect it from rivers or those shallow water deposits and put it in dirty jerry cans that aren't nice and brand new from the hardware store like this one. They're old and been donated by whatever organization or whatever military campaign left them there. Most of them used to hold diesel or gasoline, and now they're all covered in dirt and dust, just like everything else. And it's not the same here. Here, you know, you go turn on the faucet and you get clean water 24-7, 365. You go drink the water out of the hose or the back of the toilet tank, and it's still just as clean. We use this perfect drinking water that they don't have anywhere near enough of. We use it for everything. We use it to wash our cars and wash our dogs. And don't even think that, you know, people live without this resource. They have no chance at it. And instead of drinking this clean water that we're just spraying down our driveway, they have to drink bacteria-infested, cholera-riddled, just green, dirty water that's slowly killing them. And it does it a lot, it does it pretty effectively. Here we have a life expectancy of 78 years. In Mozambique, they had just lived for 49 years on average. I couldn't imagine if my grandparents, who are getting on in their 80s now, had you know, passed away when they were 50 because of cholera. That's just not something that we're used to here. Everybody you know, is expected to live in the old, gray-haired age. When I was, I spent a month there in Malawi and Mozambique, and I maybe, I could probably count on my hand the number of gray-haired people I saw. They just aren't around. They don't live long enough to get to that age. When they hit about 40 or 50, they're either grandparents or, you know, they're the elders of the community and that's as much as they're gonna get. They're not gonna go any further than that. 
And that's just unfair for these kids. It's unfair that they have to drink out of rivers and go collect water instead of going to school. They have to risk life and limb fighting crocodiles and hippos just to fill a can like this with five gallons of water to bring back to their family every day. It's, it's not right. We're forcing these kids to play a game of roulette that they didn't even know they were going to be stuck in. They were born into this world with no choice, no say in it. None of us are. None of us chose to be born in America. We just lucked into it. We won and they lost. And that's just not right. They shouldn't have to live like that. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a question. Where you were, okay, so here we, t we all take it for granted that we have clean water. Um, but where you were, why was it that they didn't have enough water? Why did they only have one gallon? Was it, did they have access to dirty water? Or was it expensive? What was the cause? Well, most of the cause was the, uh, in the village like Chabuli, they use the wells. And that's a very good system for them. They end up with water wells that can uh, feed the whole community, but they start drawing down that aquifer level because they use it for everything. Mm -hmm. the, the, those countries don't have enough water resources in the right places. Malawi has one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world, hmm. but it's up in the north. And so the people in the southern part, in Chibuli near Mozambique, they don't get to use that. They don't have any sort of access to it. And so they're forced to draw down these aquifer levels and keep having to move their wells deeper and deeper which causes them to use resources they don't have, and sometimes it ends up breaking the wells and making them unusable completely because they mess up the piping inside trying to draw wow. down more water. And then in villages like Nyachakaza, they have just the rivers, which are dirty water, contaminated with every possible pollutant you could imagine, and that's their only source. Wow. So before you installed the water systems, what water did you drink? We bought bottled water in the city which they do have, it's just incredibly high price. You know, we're paying pretty much the same price as we pay for water here, and that doesn't sound like too much, but everything there was so much cheaper. I bought a name brand jacket at a market there, name brand for here, it was uh, Sean John, I think, and I paid $3 for it. The jacket was pretty much brand new, it had no rips, stains, and everything worked perfectly, and I paid just $3 for it. And that's how much we paid for a single half liter of water. Oh, well, thank you. Very interesting.